Hello, everybody. Apologies for not being able to be there in person today. I have a PhD defense that I have to attend over in Trondheim, Norway. So I'm going to be giving my lecture remotely. So let's jump into it. Okay. So last time we started with shifting gears and focusing on the light reactions in plants. And so to give you a, a very quick overview, what we did was we focused on the attributes of light. So we talked about radiation and why that's important for plants. We also talked about the evolutionary history of photoautotrophy as it relates to the understanding of the structure of the photosynthetic apparatus. And we zeroed in on the light harvesting reactions. And um, kind of the take home message is that this is really the basis of our modern view of the light reactions in photosynthesis. So before kind of focusing on the main aspects of the lecture today, what I wanted to do is review some of the important aspects of the light reactions. Okay, so I should, before doing that, I should probably tell you what we're gonna be mainly focusing on today, and that is an overview of the land plant phylogeny. Um, so we're gonna be introducing some of the major land plant clades after we review the basics of, of uh, light reactions. We'll be talking about multicellularity and we'll be talking about the main story of the evolution of the land plants, which is really the invasion of the land. And so the invasion of the land really uh, was kind of entailed a series of unique selection pressures for life on land. And so we're going to be kind of telling you then the, the initial stories for um, how then plants came to invade the land and the unique selection pressure, pressures. But to do so, we also have to introduce uh, this concept of life cycles. And so I'll be covering some of the basics of, of life, life cycles today. Okay. So as of last time, I told you what was universal uh, of photosynthesis. And so we can express then this universality of photosynthesis in terms of this basic equation having to do with an oxidation reduction process where we have a donor uh, molecule and an acceptor molecule and that is then going to be expressed again in this oxidation reduction process. Basically the donor is going to be oxidized and the acceptor then is going to be reduced. And this universal equation of photosynthesis reflects again this passing along of this stolen electron that is then going to then be donated. Okay, so that's the, kind of the basic universal photosynthetic equation. But we can also talk about what's universal about photosynthesis in terms of the structure of the light harvesting reactions themselves. And I told you last time that there are three kind of main components. We have this chlorophyll-based light harvesting uh, arrangement of pigments. We have this design of this antenna as well as this reaction center. But then we also have um, this core of what we call a reaction center. And it's also, it's made up of these proteins called heterodimeric proteins. And those proteins are actually quite important as I'll get to in a second. Okay, so in terms of chlorophyll-based pigments, um, these chlorophyll-based pigments then are really gonna be the site where light is gonna be harvested. and Light then is going to be hitting then these, these chlorophyll-based pigments, exciting then electrons. These electrons um, are then passed along into the reaction center themselves. And so we talked about within um, each of these reaction centers, I'm sorry, surrounding these reaction centers, we're going to have this uh, kind of this halo of these chlorophyll-based pigments. And so these pigments then can differ um, from each other. So we talked about chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Um, we mainly talk about chlorophyll A, but there's a bunch of additional pigments as well. Um, within bacteria, there are these uh, pigments known as bacterial chlorophylls. But then also within plants, we also see these other pigments known as carotenoids, bilin pigments, and so on. And each of these different pigments then kind of extends then the range of light harvesting by being sensitive to differing, um, uh, differing wavelengths of light. Okay, 
So the second major uh, physical component of what's universal in photosynthesis is um, this antenna reaction design. And again, this is a spatial kind of design. That is, it's this relationship between the light harvesting pigments and the actual uh, reaction uh, centers themselves. And so I gave you this really crappy diagram here where kind of showing you the, the overall arrangement where we have these pigment molecules and surrounding them these uh, this heterodimeric uh, protein then core, this reaction center, where then uh, the overall function is that um, these pigment molecules are being sensitive then to light, um, electrons that are then being excited and then passed along then to this uh, reaction center then in the center. And I also gave you this kind of crude diagram, um, kind of showing then what this reaction center uh, this pigment and reaction center then design actually looks like where we have this antenna complex okay, that then consists of um, many many of these um, chlorophyll pigments which are then going to be kind of cooperating then together in terms of the transfer then of electrons directly then to the reaction center itself and here at the reaction center we're getting this interaction between the electron donor and the electrons acceptor itself and again, it was only recently where we've come then to understand what this true reaction uh, antenna reaction center design actually looks like. And so here what I'm showing you is um, this structural arrangement of all of these different chlorophyll base um, molecules kind of surrounding in a series of concentric rings and larger rings, this reaction center um, right here in the center. And so these then are pointed uh, at the sun. So remember, this is, these are these chlorophyll-based pigments. Then they're going to be based within the membranes of uh, chlorophyll, uh, I'm sorry, of the um, chloroplast um, membranes. These then are going to be pointed then at the sun, all right? We're then taking then the sun's energy. Pigments then are going to be uh, excited. Electrons are then going to be aimed directly at the reaction center at, this, at, the, at the center. So again, it's the spatial organization that's pretty important. So this is the basic photosynthetic unit. Okay, in terms of the antenna reaction center design, there's actually one deviation from this general design. Okay, so across all kind of photosynthetic organisms, we see this universal antenna reaction design uh, but we see one deviation. And so with, if we look within this one group of organisms known as halobacteria, halobacteria actually live in these extreme saline environments. Um, so they're actually close by. If you go to the Owens Valley uh, within California, some of these really dry lake beds then that uh, receive a lot of moisture from the winter, but then they start to dry up as the summer then approaches. Some of these lakes then turn this pinkish then color. Uh, that pinkish color is actually due to these bacteria known as halobacteria. Um, and if we, it actually turns out that these are photosynthetic organisms. And if you kind of look within um, their light reactions, and if we reconstruct then this antenna reaction center design, it's actually reminiscent and very similar then to the antenna reaction um, center design that we see in other groups, but actually kind of structurally, they're definitely different. Um, and it actually uh, uh, turns out that they contain a retinal protein system, it's actually a single protein, um, that is quite different than the rest of uh, uh, kind of the photosynthetic um, machinery that we see in other organisms. Uh, but it actually turns out that this membrane uh, is a retinal protein. And it turns out that it's quite similar to the same protein then that you actually have within your eyes, okay, within your eyeball. So you've heard, maybe heard of uh, these retinal proteins in terms of being um, sensitive to light um, within mammals. Um, that's how you actually see. So you have this retinal protein that is sensitive to light. That sensitivity is then transferred on uh, in terms of electrical stimulus in your brain in terms of differences in light. Well, it turns out that these halobacteria, um, it looks like they've evolved a similar set of proteins, um, these retinal proteins, that are also sensitive to light. And this is quite different than um, these proteins um, 
uh, involved in the reaction center design in uh, the rest of the photosynthetic organisms. So again, it's this uh, interesting uh, retinal protein, which is known as bacteriorhodopsin, okay, bacteriorhodopsin, that appears to have evolved uh, independently within the halo bacteria. And so the overall consequences of this is that it looks as if the light reactions of photosynthesis have evolved at least twice. Um, and this is actually quite intriguing because um, this gets to kind of like the underlying kind of like questions of, you know, how easy is it to evolve um, light reactions or uh, that are the basis then of photosynthesis? Well, it looks as if here on Earth that the light reactions of photosynthesis has evolved at least twice. Um, once within a lot of these different photosynthetic uh, organisms that we have on Earth that are based then on um, uh, this kind of core uh, reaction center design. Um, but within then the reaction center design, we see these two different flavors. And one of these flavors uh, is expressed as the halo bacterium, where we see probably the independent evolution of this reaction center design, in particular, the use of this retinal protein, bacterial rhodopsin. Oh, I should just emphasize that this is an example of biochemical convergence, uh, convergence of this reaction center design. Okay, so let's focus a little bit more on these individual reaction centers, these dimeric protein complexes. Um, so the overall function of this reaction center is to convert that energy into a usable form. And we have two types then of reaction centers, something known as a phaophyton and quinone then center, but then also we have a center known as an iron sulfur center. And each of these different reaction centers, these two types, um, are actually quite special because they together improve the light harvesting ability then of many photosynthetic organisms. And so for a variety of different groups and clades, including cyanobacteria and then eukaryotic plants, these two types of reaction centers actually coexist within the same individual. So in several different organisms, we see that these two types of reaction centers are actually separate, but within the cyanobacteria and the eukaryotic plants, these two types of reaction centers actually coexist together, and they're known as photosystems. And so photosystem number one is representative of these iron sulfur clus clusters, and photosystem two is a representative of these phaophyton and quinone clusters. And again, these are known as photosystems. So what are photosystems? Photosystems then are clusters of light absorbing pigments and associated electron characters within the membranes of chloroplasts. So here I'm showing you a uh, reconstruction then of all of the different molecules um, that are consisting then of, in this case, photosystem two, what they then look like as they're all kind of grouped together in these clusters within then the membranes of chloroplasts. And again, these clusters are known as photosystems. And the overall function of these photosystems is to absorb light over most of the entire visible spectrum, that is, most of visible light. So within the higher plants, within the eukaryotic plants, these reaction centers coexist. And so together, both photosystem one and two, these two different clusters of light harvesting molecules, allows for many more complex functions. In particular, uh, organisms then that contain both photosystem one and two are much more efficient at harvesting light. And together, the overall functions of these reaction centers are to steal electrons, to trap light energy, to then create a gradient of ATP, and then to ultimately produce these high energy containing compounds. Okay, so let's step back and kind of summarize everything then we've learned. So here is a photosystem antenna complex. So this is just one photosystem where we have a grouping then of these different molecules together. So again, we have our sun with radiation coming down on the earth. These clusters then of pigments 
are then going to be harvesting this light and then exciting electrons, which are then aimed at the reaction center, where you have an electron donor and an electron acceptor. So it's universal then about photosynthesis is that we have these chlorophyll-based pigments, this antenna reaction design center, and this reaction center. Okay. But remember, we have two different types of reaction centers known as either photosystem one or photosystem two. So here I'm expressing these two different groupings then of, um, uh, of molecules then together that consist of either photosystem two or PS2 or PS1. And so it turns out that in photosystem two, photosystem two then is going to be harvesting light at wavelengths differ from photosystem one. So photosystem two harvests lights at energy and wavelengths less than 680 nanometers, whereas photosystem one harvests additional energy in wavelengths longer than 680 nanometers. But what's interesting here and pretty cool is that both of these photosystems then are hooked up to each other. That is at first, um, light energy is then gonna be stimulating then electrons that are gonna be passed then to the reaction center in photosystem two. We're then going to be passing along then this electron to then photosystem one, where its energetic state is then increased. And so if you see here on the left-hand side, I'm actually plotting um, the overall energy level of these electrons then as they're being passed along. So this is the potential energy then that's actually ultimately captured. And then as it's passed along from photosystem two to photosystem one, and we see an overall increase in terms of how much energy is actually stolen then from the sun and stored in the form of, in this case, ultimately NADPH. And so we're gonna be getting to a little bit more detail of that as we go along, in particular, when we talk more about the carbon reactions in, in the Calvin cycle. And so that'll come. All right, so to summarize, we have two groups then of clusters of um, photosynthetic molecules associated with the uh, light harvesting reactions, photosystem two and photosystem one. And within the um, eukaryotic plants, we see these coexisting then together. Okay, and the overall kind of function then of the light reactions to overall summarize is to steal, okay, electrons. We're then gonna be capturing then light energy and we're gonna then be producing stored high energy, okay? So together, all of these different photosynthetic uh, molecules with associated the light reactions are ultimately going to be found within the phospholipid bilayer then of chloroplasts. And so here we see these molecules of photosystem two, but also photosystem one. There are then gonna be coupled together and sitting right next to each other in these uh, membranes of the chloroplasts. And we can see the overall functions then of the light harvesting reactions. So here we're gonna be harvesting light in both photosystem one, I'm sorry, photosystem two and photosystem one. We're gonna be stealing then electrons from water. Okay, so remember water then is gonna be donating then an electron and this electron is then gonna be passed along from photosystem two to photosystem one. We're then going to be uh, creating then oxygen from this process, but then we're also gonna be um, kind of donating then these protons um, in the process. And we're also then gonna be creating a proton gradient. And this proton gradient then is ultimately utilized at kind of the end of this uh, series of different um, biochemical reactions, where then we're gonna have this molecule known as ATP synthetase. And ATP synthetase then takes, then utilizes this proton gradient to then create ATP. So here, ATP synthetase takes ADP in the presence of this proton gradient, utilizes then that gradient then to produce ATP. And the end of the day, we're creating not only ATP, but also this passed along then electron is then used to convert NADP plus to NADPH. And NADPH then is a molecule then that's, uh, again, within this higher energy state, this is stored energy. And this energy is then gonna be used then to fuel then the carbon reactions that we'll talk about later on in the class. Okay, so to summarize, here then are the functions of the light reactions. Stealing electrons, harvesting light, 
generating a proton gradient that then is used to create ATP. And then we're going to be creating energy and storage molecules in both ATP and NADPH. Okay, so where does ATP and NADPH, NADPH go? Ultimately, well, the Calvin cycle or these light independent reactions, we also call these the carbon reactions. This is carboxylation. This is going to be involving a series of different important enzymes, but this is going to be um, a series of reducing then uh, reactions. And we're also going to be regenerating then these uh, different molecules back and forth between the light reactions and the carbon reactions. And so there's going to be a larger question that we're going to be addressing as the class goes on in terms of what actually limits uh, photosynthetic rates um, of, of most plants. And so it actually turns out that there's a lot of light energy out there in the world. And most of the time, what regulates variation in photosynthetic rate is actually carboxylation, okay, or these carbon reactions associated with the Calvin cycle. And this is going to be the topic of quite a few discussions later on in the class, okay? And so we're going to be discussing then how we couple then these different reactions then together. All right. But if we step all the way back, this is our overall big picture where we're having uh, a photosynthesis. And so we have here these light reactions that we've just gone over, um, where we have then the coupling of then these overall carbon reactions, okay? And these carbon reactions and the light reactions and the coupling then together is going to form then the basis of our total understanding of photosynthesis. But we're going to be coming back to this much later. Okay. So to step back and give you kind of a big kind of evolutionary overview of photosynthesis. So I have here a timeline in terms of the age of the earth and billions of years. So we're going from present day here, going all the way back to three, four billion years ago. And so what I would like you to do is focus on this relative contribution to photosynthesis across then the globe. So around, uh, gosh, 3.5 to 3 billion years ago, we see then uh, the evolution of photosynthetic bacteria. And by far, they were dominating photosynthetic rates on the planet. Then we see the evolution of blue-green algae, all right, around 2 billion years ago. Then we see the evolution of eukaryotic algae around 1 billion years ago. But then we see the land plants then evolving um, about 500, 400 million years ago. So in terms of the relative contribution to photosynthesis on the planet, we see this progression for, from photosynthetic bacteria, blue-green, eukaryotic algae, and then the higher plants. And for the rest then of the course, we're gonna be focusing mainly on this component here, this transition between the evolution of eukaryotic algae, but then also the common ancestor then that often that, that then gave rise to the higher plants. So photosynthetic rate has been quite important in terms of the evolution of, uh, of the Earth, going back as far as around 3 billion years ago. So the light reactions are, provide then a foundation for all of this. And so I hope you appreciate that now. Okay. So as I kind of get ready here, I would like you to think about what then are the three products of the light reactions, okay? And so this goes back to our pop quiz then that we had the other day. So the three products of the light reactions include ATP and ADPH and oxygen. So what's universal about the light reactions? Well, light energy is absorbed by pigments, right? So this chlorophyll containing pigments. This energy is used to steal electrons from, from a molecule. And so we focus mainly on the example of water, but remember that's not always the case. But then also what's universal about the light reactions is that we have the production of NADPH and AP, ATP. All right. So let's step back and think now more about early events in land plant evolution. So all of life has one common ancestor. Right? So we know that then from uh, not only everything from uh, the fossil uh, record, but also in terms of our understanding of molecular evolution. For all we know, all of life has one common ancestor. So all 
land plants, also known as the embryophytes, have ultimately have their origins in the ocean, right, in the aquatic environments, and ultimately related then to a common ancestor uh, within the eukaryotic multicellular algae. Okay, so all land plants ultimately share a common ancestor, and that common ancestor most likely was a multicellular uh, algae. Okay, so photosynthetic prokaryotic unicellular bacteria, but then we have this ancestral eukaryotic photosynthetic unicellular organism. So within the green algae, we know um, this group of plants, this one clade, contains chlorophyll A and B. Okay? And again, these are multicellular algae. So most likely this common ancestor was within the green algae, but then had the unique synapomorphy of having photosynthetic um, pigments of chlorophyll A and B. Okay, so the land plants. Common ancestor within the multicellular algae, but then characterized then by synapomorphy of chlorophyll A and B. Okay. So in terms of the geologic time chart, okay, all kind of signs point to, and all bits of evidence point to the evolution of the land plants or the embryophytes sometime during the Silurian at approximately, hmm, let's see, between about 500 and 400 million years ago. So I would like to kind of emphasize here that I would like you to know the times of the first radiations of the major plant clades in each of these groups then covered within this class, okay? So when we look then at the geologic time chart, okay, we can go back all the way back to the Precambrian. So this is billions of years. Um, so remember origin of the planet around 5 billion years ago. But then as we go through, we're going to go through the Cambrian, the Ordovician, the Silurian, Devonian, the Carboniferous, Triassic, Jurassic, all the way up to present day, past the Quaternary period. And so we're going to be focusing on each of these different um, geological time periods, and some of them we're going to emphasize more than others, but I would like you to know the relative timing then of each of these geologic time periods. So we're going to start around the Silurian time period which ranges on the order of about 439 to about 409 million years ago. Okay, so if we step back and we look at where the land plants then occur, this is a very crude phylogeny then of the eukaryotes, ranging from animals, fungi, we have here the red algae, but then we also have the green algae, and then other protists in general. So here we have our ancestral eukaryote, and in general in this crude phylogeny, notice we have a big polytomy you know, down here. And so currently this is the focus of a lot of research is then to elucidate all of these events of early eukaryotic uh, evolution. But for the purpose of this class, um, we're gonna be focusing on this group of plants known as the Viridae plantae, the Viridae plantae. These are the groups then of plants that include the green algae and the land plants. So remember, green algae there are then aquatic, but then the land plants obviously are not aquatic for the most part, they live on land, okay? So we're gonna zoom in then on this one grouping then of plants, the Viridae plantae. And so the ancestor then of this group lived approximately 800 million years ago. And so we know that, okay, based on not only fossil evidence, but also molecular evidence then as well. And in general, this common ancestor then had a, um, a series of traits, um, but in particular, one set of traits that are characterized then as a synapomorphy then for this clade, in particular, chlorophyll A and B. So all of these unicellular and multicellular green algae, and then the land plants. And so if you notice here, the land plants are this last little branch here um, within this, this large clade. Um, all of these uh, individual, all these taxa, then are characterized as having chlorophyll A and B. This is the synapomorphy then for this clade, the Viridae plantae. So if you notice there here at the top, I have a bunch of extant um, unicellular, multicellular green algae. Um, again, these are all aquatic then plants, but then we have this last group, grouping of plants here uh, known as then the embryophytes. 
Oh, I should also point out that another trait that appears to be consistent um, across all of the uh, all of the taxa within this group is also cellulose. So chlorophyll A and B and cellulose then appears to be characterizing them this common ancestor that lived about 800 million years ago. Okay, so now we're going to be simplifying then the phylogeny of this group. Okay, into this. Okay, and so this is the phylogeny of, of the basal land plants and the closely related groups of green algae. All right. And so I'm taking them this phylogeny from uh, the Nicholas book. And um, I should also emphasize that whenever we then show a phylogeny, also realize that this is a hypothesis based on all available evidence that we have to us, including um, not only molecular evidence, but also some, um, some morphological evidence. But this is based then on current molecular evidence. But I should also emphasize that um, the basis then of this phylogeny is um, currently um, an active area of research. And people still debate the relative placement of each of these different uh, taxa. But for this class, I would actually like you to memorize um, this basic phylogeny here uh, for the basal land plants and the closely related green algal groups. Okay, so we have the Groups known as the chlorophytes, the karyophytes, the liverworts, hornworts, mosses, and tracheophytes. Um, and this number here um, reflects uh, the approximate number of extant species in each of these different groups. So, so these are, these are um, the uh, different species that are currently living then today. And as you can see, there's actually quite a few numbers then of these different species. So you've probably heard of some of these groups, including mosses in particular. But we're going to come back then to this phylogeny um, in a little bit more detail as we then kind of go along here today. So what I would like you then to also um, kind of be listening out for is that we want to understand then the specific adaptations then that characterize each of the different nodes, these numbered then nodes, then within this one clade. Okay. So in stepping back, what we're interested in knowing are what then are the synapomorphies or the specific traits associated with each of these common ancestors. But then we want to understand the unique selective pressures then operating on each of these different common ancestors that ultimately led then to the divergence then and radiation of each of these different then groups. Okay. So one important aspect um, when we talk then about the invasion of the land uh, has to do with multicellularity. All right, going from unicellular to multicellular organisms. So then across the tree of life, if we look at both plants and animals, we know that multicellularity, it actually turns out, has evolved more than once, um, suggesting then pretty strong selection pressures in certain environments for the evolution of multicellularity. So why become multicellular? Why intense selective pressures become multicellular? Well, it turns out that there appears to be several different advantages in certain environments to being multicellular. If you're multicellular, it turns out that you can have specialized cells, such as tissues and organs, that can do more tasks. In particular, um, if you're going to have uh, specialized cells, well, you can also have cell-cell communication, but also transport of uh, hormones or signals or materials between then different cells. <laughs> Another advantage of becoming multicellular is that you can have increased cell surface area. And that is, in general, if you become multicellular, you tend to become larger, which means you have more surface areas across all your different cells, and because of which, you can access more resources and you can become more powerful. You can uh, kind of assimilate more resources per unit time over a given uh, search area, and you can uh, kind of acquire more resources to become more powerful. But this increase in size also means that you can buffer yourselves from more of the extremes of the environment. So there's benefits then of becoming larger in different environments. But also big things tend to live longer, right? So the, the larger you are, the longer you tend to live. The bigger you are, you can access resources and environments that are not available then to smaller organisms. So benefits of multicellularity, you can have specialized cells, increased cell surface areas, but then also you can become larger. 
And each of these are actually specific adaptations that actually enable access to more resources, but also if you're more powerful accessing more resources, you can outcompete more and you can increase ultimately the survivorship um, and increase the number of offspring, basically the two components then of fitness. Okay, so when is an organism multicellular? Well, that's an interesting question, but in general, to become multicellular, your neighboring cells have to adhere, they have to interact, and they have to physio physiologically communicate then with each other. So within plants in particular, but also across all of organisms, direct physical contact is achieved then in four different ways. And within plants, um, we have uh, something known as tight junctions. These are specific proteins that actually uh, help out in terms of having individual cell membranes bonding with each other and adhering them with each other. Some the structures known as desmosomes. Desmosomes then are regions then um, where intracellular fil filaments can extend from one cell then to another. And these desmosomes are actually the basis by which materials, uh, molecules, hormones, can then actually pass them between then cells. There are also structures known as gap junctions. These are actually open pores then that connect then um, uh, two different cells then together. And so these pores are then surrounded by specific proteins that then can assist or uh, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of help out in some sort of way um, that then help out in passing materials then from one cell then to each other. So tight junctions, desmosomes, gap junctions, but then in particular, and this is what I would like to emphasize, plasmodesmata. Plasmodesmata are actually specific open channels within plant cell walls then that connect then cells together. Okay, so within the plant, uh, kind of the land plants in general, we see the importance of plasmodesmata in terms of um, uh, Kind of enabling not only uh, multicellular, uh, uh, multicellular then to uh, multicellularity then to evolve, but also there's a functionality associated with plasma desmata that actually uh, enabled physical communication then between cells, and this is actually plasma desmata are actually quite important because as we'll find out, plant cells differ from animal cells because uh, they actually have something known as a cell wall. And we're going to be talking about cell walls as we kind of go on. So here, let's step back and, and kind of look at a, an individual plant cell themselves. And so we see uh, kind of neighboring plant cells surrounding this one plant cell. If we kind of zoom in then on this, this junction um, between then two different um, plant cells, we actually see this light green area and this other light green area here. These are two different cell walls then that are, um, that are then surrounding each of these different cells. But then we'll see these little gaps or these tunnels then uh, between them. These are then uh, the individual plasmodesmata themselves. So these are, are these holes or these tunnels then uh, that kind of burrow then through um, the cell walls then themselves. And the end result is that we have a single living protoplast then that's shared then between the two different cells, but they're shared then via these little tunnels or these holes known as um, plasma desmata. Okay, and so the, the cell membrane is actually continuous as then the cell membrane is then passed then through these little uh, plasma desmata and so that we have one continuous cytoplasm from one cell then to the next, which is pretty cool. So within multicellular plants, we see this single living protoplast then connecting all of these adjoining cells. And these cell membranes, okay, which line then the plasmodesmatal channels are continuous from one cell to the next. And the end result is that throughout we have a single living mass of cytoplasm that is water and molecules, and then they're gonna be passing with relative ease from one cell to the other. And the result is that water and molecules can freely flow then and be modified by uh, effectively altering the number of location of plasma desmata um, within multicellular plants. And so all these adjoining cells are gonna be sharing these plasma desmata and we can then vary their intensity and the number of them, and, and 
that is then going to be influencing how molecules and various um, uh, 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 kind of stored forms of energy and even water are then going to be transported. So we can then start to think of how selection in unique environments can influence the transport of materials from one cell to the other. And again, this is the basic prerequisite for survival and growth of larger land plants. Okay, so plasma desmata, critically important in terms of the evolution of multicellularity. Okay, so in terms of the invasion of the land, we can start to think of what are the unique selective pressures operating on these first multicellular green algae um, in terms of what were the unique selective pressures that uh, enabled them to live then on land. And so the first organisms to survive and reproduce on land were actually multicellular plants. Right? So this is a feat then that was accomplished well before animals. But these multicellular plants actually had specific adaptations for growing and successfully reproducing them on land. So how do you transition from an aquatic environment, you know, from these oceans uh, all the way then to the land, right? How can we think of these, uh, these, each of these unique steps, unique um, steps in evolution by natural selection in order then to invade then the land? Well, this is actually quite important because again, it was the plants then that provided the shelter and the food for the first land animals. And again, this is the first energetic basis then for terrestrial ecosystems. Okay, so the botanical invasion of the land, I want you to think of this as an invasion of the air, right? So we have these organisms um, living within aquatic environments, okay, within, within a water-based environment, but then we have this transition to living then within the air. And this actually required numerous key morphological and physiological departures from these ancestral aquatic then species. And moving them from water then to the land gives a series of, of, of problems associated with drying out, okay? And so the word then we use for drying out is known as desiccation, right? And so to control then the loss of water, Okay, so you don't dry out was actually quite critical. So there are these problems of desiccation and how do we deal with water loss? And so these first land plants were plants then that share very close ancestors to these modern extant then groups of plants known as mosses, hornworts, and liverworts. Now these plants are actually quite small in stature and they're highly kind of restricted to moist environments then on land. All right, so small in stature, and they tend to be uh, found uh, present day in really moist environments. Okay, so again, this invasion then of the land was really the invasion of the air. Okay, so how do we understand these early selective forces, okay, for the evolution of the land plants? Well, what we can do is we can step back and we can kind of look to basic kind of physical principles to help us understand the unique selective environments then for life on land. And they effectively help us define what are the primary selective forces operating then on land plants. Okay, so to do this, I want to step back and focus on kind of this um, physical principle known as diffusion. And we're gonna characterize then diffusion by a relatively simple equation. And this is known as Fick's first law of diffusion. So let me see if I can walk you through this here. So we're gonna be mainly talking about passive diffusion, where here we're gonna have a series of molecules that are then gonna be diffusing along a given distance, and that distance is gonna then vary, known as X. So X then is our, our diffusion then distance, and that diffusion is gonna be occurring across a surface area. Think of it as a membrane surface area of a cell. So here's our cell. And we're gonna be interested in the diffusion of um, some given molecules or a solute um, S. And so these molecules are gonna be diffusing from high concentration to a lower concentration area within our cell. And so we're gonna make sense of diffusion and how molecules then diffuse by Fick's first law. 
And so let's step a little bit further back and ask why we're interested in diffusion in the first place. Well, let's think of um, diffusion as being um, kind of important in terms of the diffusion of a kind of critical molecule. Maybe it's nitrogen, or maybe it's the diffusion of water, okay? So something kind of critical for these early land plants in particular. Um, let's think about water. Okay, so Fick's first law of diffusion states that the rate of diffusion, right? So we have this ds dt. So this is the rate of diffusion of the solute S. So S here is our solute. T again is in time. So this is how fast then the solute then is diffusing. That then the rate of diffusion is then going to be equal to is one, two, three different terms here, d, a, and then this, uh, uh, this term right here, which we'll get to in a minute. So d then is the diffusion coefficient. And the diffusion co coefficient then is going to be unique then to the solute then of interest. And that tends to be a constant, but it's a constant then that's going to vary depending on the environment. This other term here, uh, this DCI uh, DX, that's our concentration gradient. So that's a difference between the concentration of the solute on the outside and the difference in the concentration of the solute then on the inside. So that's our concentration gradient. The difference in the solute concentration at different points then of our gradient. And A here, this is the surface area through which diffusion then occurs. And so I would like you then to memorize this relatively simple equation. And whenever I emphasize an equation in this class, the first thing I want you to ask is, what can natural selection operate on? And so if this was an organism or a cell in this case, what then are the traits that are then characterizing then this organism? Well, that trait then could actually be how big then that unicell or that multicellular organism is, and that is the surface area over which um, molecules then are going to be diffusing. So um, selection could actually, in this case, operate on the surface area then of the cell, but then natural selection could also operate on the concentration gradient as well. But we should then also ask if selection can operate on the diffusion coefficient. So remember, we're talking about the initial steps for selection then uh, to make this transition uh, to life on land. Okay. So in thinking about these basic equations, you can ask, what if delta C here is a large number and delta X is then fixed? What then happens then to the rate of evolution? So if this number here, in terms of the, relating then to the concentration gradient, if the concentration then of the solute then increases relative then to the distance, what happens then to the rate of diffusion? But what if this concentration difference is fixed, but then the distance over which you transport becomes larger? What then happens to the rate of diffusion? And so I think that's a, a decent homework question for you, and you can step back and try to figure that out. But what you'll actually find is that there's a direct dependence then in this equation in terms of the rate of diffusion on the surface area. So if we double then the surface area, we then double then the rate of diffusion, but then also the rate of diffusion is inversely related then to the distance, okay? So as we increase the distance by which um, the solute then has to diffuse, the rate of diffusion then slows down. So we see a direct dependence of diffusion on the surface area, but an inverse relationship then with the distance. And so this is fixed first law of diffusion is going to form then the basis by which we can start to understand the unique selective pressures operating on plants for life on land. Okay, so life is then constrained by this basic physical process, okay, diffusion. How can this physical process then actually influence evolution? Well, we want to know how selection can operate, can act on individuals to maximize then your rate of diffusion, right? So diffusion is going to be quite important for the transport of water, transport then of nitrogen, transport of resources in general within plants. So 
how can selection maximize um, rates, uh, maximize rates of diffusion? Well, selection then should maximize maybe surface area, right, A, or you can think of that as the surface area then to volume ratio. But a potential problem here, and we're going to kind of emphasize this throughout then the class, because life on land, remember, is life in the air, water loss or desiccation is also quite important. So if you're bigger or have a bigger surface area relative then to your volume, for a land plant, that's a potential problem because of desiccation. So if you're larger, more exposed, there's a potential problem of water loss. Well, potentially then, selection could also minimize the transport distances, right? So that's another way of maximizing your um, uh, rate then of diffusion. But there's another potential there in terms of a trade-off in that, well, you sacrifice the benefits of increased size. So remember previously I told you that there are some benefits to being becoming bigger, okay? So in this one example, I'm using this equation to then kind of hypothetically think about depending on the different environments, what then selection then could be operating on, okay? And we're using fixed law then to start to frame then our understanding for the unique selective pressures for life on land, okay? So fixed first law is helping us think about that, okay? Oh, I forgot to mention, there are other um, kind of benefits of increased size. It's also dispersal ability, but also increased surface area and then for obtaining more resources. All right. All right, so life is constrained by this basic physical process. All right, so let's see if we can use fixed fix law of diffusion to help us understand why then plants actually invaded then the land. Okay. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use fixed first law to then ask, is diffusion in water more efficient or is diffusion in air more efficient? Okay. So let's kind of step back and assume that um, our surface area, and this makes the math actually a little easy, um, the surface area uh, of our organism is one meter. Okay. So A is then going to be one meter. And the distance then here is also going to be one meter. So our surface area is one meter squared, and our distance over which um, diffusion is going to be occurring is one meter. Okay, so here we're going to compare two different environments. We're going to compare an organism then growing um, in the air, okay, or on land, and then also an organism occurring then in pure water. So remember, we know that um, for this group then of, of plants, the Viridae plantae, the green plants, they were aquatic, okay? The, the common ancestor then was aquatic, okay? And so obviously they're living in pure water. So let's look at the, cofusion, the diffusion coefficients then for CO2, okay? So remember CO2 is going to be used in photosynthesis to a, um, so uh, photosynthesis is assimilating then CO2, and we're using then CO2 then to produce sugars, which is then um, the basis then of photoautotrophy. Okay. So the diffusion coefficients of CO2 in air turns out to be 1.47 times 10 to the minus fifth meter squared per second, right? But then within pure water, it turns out the diffusion coefficient is different. So the diffusion coefficient then changes depending on the environment. And in pure water, it's 1.8 times 10 to the minus nine meters squared then per second. But we also know that within, the, within aquatic environments, within water, the concentration of CO2 turns out to be 0.0117 moles, then actually that's <laughs> per volume. And for air, it turns out to be 0.0125 moles per volume. Now, we also know that the concentration of CO2 within the plant is on the order of about 7 times 10 to the minus 3 moles per volume. Now, you know the concentration difference, so we now can calculate the concentration distance, uh, difference. And if we know then 
the distance of transport for diffusion to be about a meter, and we know these diffusion coefficients then in CO2, we can actually calculate the speed of diffusion for an organism growing in the water and an organism growing then in the land. And so we can ask, is diffusion of water or the air more efficient for CO2? So it actually turns out that the calculated flux densities for our typical plant growing in the air or on land or living in the water, turns out that in the air, it's 8.09, 10 to the minus five moles of CO2 per meter squared per second compared to the water, 8.46 times 10 to the minus seven moles of CO2 per meter squared per second. So if you are a plant where the sole interest then of selection is to maximize then the diffusion rate of CO2, who has the advantage? Who can perform photosynthesis at a higher rate? A plant living in the air or a plant living in the water? I'm gonna pause for a sip of coffee. The terrestrial plant has the advantage by two orders of magnitude. So think of that. If you are a multicellular aquatic plant, but then somehow had the ability to also perform photosynthesis in the air, your photosynthetic rates are gonna be two orders of magnitude higher on land than in the, the aquatic environment. So two orders of magnitude difference. But the aquatic plant has the advantage of the terrestrial plant in terms of controlling water loss. If you live then in the water, you don't have to worry so much about water loss or desiccation. So there's a fundamental trade-off here. On the one hand, a terrestrial plant will have a much higher photosynthetic rate per unit volume, whereas the aquatic plant will have a much better uh, way of controlling than desiccation. Okay, so three specific adaptations of land plants need for survival. A cuticle to prevent desiccation. Okay. So in order then for life on land, you need to prevent desiccation. So we see strong selection for an external kind of coat or external surface um, to slow then rates of water loss. And so this immediately introduces a fundamental trade-off as plants then depend on gas exchange of CO2 and water. And we're gonna be emphasizing this throughout the course. And because of which, we also see the evolution of something known as stomates. And stomates are actually openings, okay, within the cuticle of the land plant that then help regulate gas exchange, then the exchange of CO2 and water. And stomates actually have specialized cells, known as guard cells, that can then open and close then this pore, uh, this opening, in order then to regulate uh, gas exchange. And so, Stomates actually have this very kind of typical uh, kind of shape, uh, these little pores or openings. And so here I'm showing you, uh, this is actually a leaf, um, uh, where we actually have this uh, epidermis, uh, this cuticle on the outside. And on them, this outside cuticle, you can see these little pores or openings surrounded by these um, specialized cells known as guard cells that help open and close then these openings. And so you can see then, Again, these little openings then that help regulate gas exchange. So sometimes these openings are closed, these guard cells close, sometimes they open, and when they open, then CO2 and water can kind of freely move in and out stomates. So we need a cuticle, we need openings known as stomates, but then we also need successful reproduction on land. And so it's one thing then to actually exchange CO2 and water and also regulate um, uh, water. Uh, and desiccation in order then to survive on land, but in order then to um, kind of live on land, not only do you need to survive, but you also need to reproduce. And so the third kind of major component uh, that all land plants faced was to have successful and reproduction then on land. And this involved actually several specific adaptations. And to make sense then of these specific adaptations, we have to talk about haploid and diploid life cycles. So land plant life cycles consists of a series of alternating 
then life cycles them together. <clears throat> seem to have lost my, here we go, full screen. So land plant life cycles consist of alternating um, kind of life cycles. So we can talk about haploid cells that are ultimately then being created by meiosis and replicated then by mitosis to create a haploid organism. But we can also talk about diploid cells that are then created by a fusion of haploid cells to form a zygote and then be replicated via my, mitosis to grow diploid organism. And so what makes land plants um, absolutely amazing is that they have taken um, this, this uh, life cycle between haploid and diploid cells that are kind of characteristic of not only the green algae, but also other groups then of organisms, and have elaborated their, their life cycle to then the reflect the unique selective pressures for life on land, okay? So we're gonna take this really bizarre concept of life cycles, which is again, this um, cycle between haploid cells and diploid cells, and selection is then gonna elaborate this for life on land, okay? And so over evolutionary time, there's actually been a reduction of this haploid phase of the plant life cycle and an elaboration of the diploid that phase. So to kind of end out here, what I would like to do is kind of emphasize um, kind of this basic land, uh, kind of this basic plant life cycle itself. Okay, and so I'm gonna take a little bit of time then to kind of, kind of elaborate on this. And so um, let's step back and kind of look at the overall cycle itself. So this is a typical green algae or a chlorophyte and life cycle. And so here we're going to be talking about these differences in the diploid and haploid then um, parts then of the life cycle. And so we can talk about um, these different components. Um, so here we have this multicellular then structure known as the sporophyte. And the sporophyte then is going to be responsible then for creating via meiosis these individual spores. And so we can talk about these reproductive structures on the sporophyte itself, known as the sporangium. And within then the sporangium, we're going to be having then meiosis occurring, where we're then going to be creating then these haploid, based on this darker color here, cells. These um, haploid then cells or spores are then going to be released then to the environment. Um, remember, these are haploid. They're then going to then settle and create these multicellular structures known as gametophytes. Okay, so immediately we have this alteration between the diploid sporophyte and a haploid sporophyte then structure. So again, plants are totally bizarre because they're going to be alternating between being diploid and haploid. And again, this alteration is known as a life cycle. So these multicellular gametes are then going to undergo another kind of form then of reproduction. We're then going to be producing gametes um, within, again, this is the aquatic environment. These gametes, you can think of both male and female gametes, are then going to fuse. This is known as syngamy. This fusion then of haploid gametes is then going to create a diploid zygote. Okay? This diploid zygote is then going to undergo mitosis and to form a diploid sporophyte. And then we're gonna restart this life cycle all over again. So again, on the diploid zygote, we're gonna have these structures known as sporangium. Within the sporangium, we're gonna be undergoing meiosis. We're then going to be kind of reducing then these diploid then cells to um, haploid then cells. These haploid cells or spores are then gonna be released in the environment. They're then going to be undergoing mitosis to form these um, larger multicellular gametophytes. Again, the gametophyte is haploid. They're going to then be releasing gametes in the environment. Uh, these gametes will fuse and same gamete to produce then a diploid zygote. Okay, long-winded uh, explanation in that 
the overall life cycle is this alteration between sporophyte and then gametophyte. And this is then the basis for elaboration and also reduction that we see within uh, the land plants. Okay, so I'm going to end out here by talking about um, these various groupings of plants, extant plants. So here's a, some of these um, kind of bizarre kind of uh, uh, basal land plants known as liverworts. Okay, and so they kind of look like this kind of slimy green tongue of photosynthetic tissue. Um, and so for the most part, when you look at these gametophytes, uh, I'm sorry, when you look at these liver, liverworts, all you're seeing is gametophyte here. And so these are all haploid organisms. Um, for the most part, because you're not seeing the sporophytic or the diploid stage of the life cycle yet. But we also know that across the liverworts, we're not really seeing any stomates yet. So these plants, liverworts, are restricted to highly moist environments. They have to be effectively bathed in water most of the time. So you'll see these in really wet parts of uh, either cloud forests or swampy areas, uh, really cool areas as well. These are the liverworts. Another group of plants are known as the hornworts. And again, most of what you see here um, is gametophyte. And most of these kind of green photosynthetic kind of uh, leafy like structures um, are haploid. But occasionally you'll see these little kind of spikelet kind of, um, kind, of, uh, kind of structures then forming. And actually that turns out to be the sporophytic um, stage then of the life cycle. And the sporophytic stage, remember, is diploid. So immediately, this is really cool, you'll see then this organism where most of this green photosynthetic structure is gametophyte or the haploid component, but then you'll see on the same plant the sporophyte, which is diploid. So totally bizarre. You see this individual plant, in this case a hornwort, where you have both the, uh, the gametophyte and the sporophyte on the same individual. Now, you've probably heard of mosses, another group of plants here. And again, same situation. If you step back and look at these individual um, kind of these moss uh, uh, kind of cushions, then these individual kind of like moss uh, individuals here, these green leafy kind of structures all around, what you're looking at is actually the gametophyte. So these green kind of leaf-like structures, this is all haploid structure, but then you'll see these little spikelets here. And um, in then the spikelet, these are kind of reproductive structures, we actually see um, these, um, the individual sporophytes themselves. So again, we see these individuals with both a gametophyte and then the sporophyte, and again, the sporophyte then being diploid. Now within mosses, we start to see structures known as stomates. Okay. So to step back, we can talk about then the embryophytes. And the embryophytes are the land plants. And the embryophytes are gonna be unique in that they're gonna be enclosing then uh, their developing embryo um, within a structure that kind of forms this sterile jacket of then cells then around them. And so the embryophytes then are these unique group of plants known as the hornworts, liverworts, the mosses, um, but also things like ferns and horsetails and lycopods, but also gymnosperms and angiosperms kind of together. Um, and so I think what I'm going to do kind of in the interest of time is I think I'm going to kind of end, but I want you to kind of um, in foreshadowing to our next then um, series of lectures, I want you then to kind of memorize the basic land plant um, phylogeny. And so here is kind of like the overall green plant phylogeny, but then we're also going to have the land plant phylogeny. And so I would like you to memorize this entire phylogeny where we have then this grouping of plants known as um, the chlorophytes and the caryophytes. These are known as the green algae. But then we're going to have a grouping of plants known then as the bryophytes, um, which is the liverworts, hornworts, and the mosses. But then we're going to have the grouping of the plants known as the embryophytes, which are the land plants, which is the liverworts, hornworts, mosses, 
and a group of plants known as the tracheophytes, which is the vascular plants, okay? So it turns out that the synapomorphy then for this clade then of the plants, which is the green plants, the, the viridity plantae, the key synapomorphy is gonna be chlorophyll A and B, but also um, this molecule known then as cellulose. Within then the caraphytes and the land plants, we're going to have the synapomorphy, um, which is going to be, and this is gonna make sense once we get into the next series of lectures. Um, and the synapomorphy is associated with the retention of fertilized eggs. And so basically we see this early ancestor then of the caryophytes and then also land plants had then the synapomorphy of being um, a good mother. And that is um, this mom actually held on to uh, her fertilized eggs um, and provided these fertilized eggs with, with a little bit more protection that enabled them for successful uh, reproduction and on land. And by the time we come to the common ancestor associated then with the embryophytes of the land plants, we see then a unique structure known as the archegonium. And the archegonium is this jacket then of cells then that protected the developing embryo within the land plants. Okay. And so the archegonium then is the key innovation then for the land plants. This is the key synapomorphy then for all of the land plants. Okay, so in stepping back and ending then the lecture for today, I would like you then to memorize this phylogeny then for the green plants, the Viridae plantae, consisting then of the green algae, the bryophytes, and the vascular plants, okay, but also consisting of the green algae and the land plants, okay. And so with that, I would like to then to end. Here then are your different then questions um, that I would like you to study. But note that coming up here on Thursday, we have our first quiz. Okay. And so with that, we'll see you here next time. So thank you very much.